Is there a question? Oh, yeah, here. Uh, Heinz, hello. Hi. How have you been? Um, I, good. I have a question for you. I mean, you have so many choices of vectors, especially working in Africa, that could provide you easy way of replicating the vector and heat resistant and environmentally resistant. Why did you pick on VSV? Um, the choice of VSV uh, was not for uh, clinical use, was not, uh, was strictly an experimental approach at the time we, we took it. Um, why we took VSV, one reason was um, the system uh, was available, uh, worked relatively well, and was close to the field of viruses, so we expected more success uh, using that system. Uh, the paramics of our systems were a little bit more complicated at that time, um, so it had no, uh, uh, there were no thoughts in terms of application uh, ever using it. Uh, as I said in my talk, the initial idea was strictly experimental, wasn't even vaccine. But I agree with you, there are many systems out, and maybe better ones. Hi, um, this question's for Dr. Porter. Um, so for the survivors, the men that you were um, treating, uh, were, are, is there any way to also see if there's still virus in the eye and if there was any efficacy? So we've thought about that a lot, and there are clinical examinations of the eye included in the study, but there's no way to non-invasively sample the eye. The only patient that has been shown to have Ebola virus in the eye, that was only one patient, and so he underwent sampling for a very particular um, case, but we can't routinely screen people. That would be very interesting. We are trying to monitor some of the other clinical symptoms of Ebola virus syndrome, but those are hard to quantify. So the semen is the only thing where we can really test for a viral RNA, and so that's why we use that as the endpoint. Hi, this is a question for Dr. Mazat. Um, can you talk a little bit about the mechanisms that you used? I think you used non-invasive mechanisms for sampling the vertebrates in uh, the predict sampling sites, and are there still plans to um, continue that type of sampling? I mean, I know that's the mission of PREDICT is to look for areas of risk, um, so I'd imagine safe fecal samples might be easily submitted. Yeah, so um, for the, it was species specific a little bit, as I mentioned, depending on the transmission interface that we, we, we would target high-risk interface locations for sampling that also had high levels of people with fevers of unknown origin, and then we would look at the transmission interface. So for example, in a guano farming kind of transmission, we would choose to sample fresh guano as it was dropping um, from, from the bats. Um, in other situations, um, we would capture animals directly, but in some situations like with um, non-human primates in areas where they were either smarter than us, hard to catch, or, um, or uh, sometimes religiously revered, um, we, would, uh, we actually did a bunch of work with primate centers and zoos to come up with methods that would get the exact same viral outcome as an anesthetized monkey with a swab um, as we could do by throwing um, swabs with the, an appropriate attractant, um, strawberry jam. <laughs> yeah, it works way better than, than uh, peanut butter inhibits PCR later so you know it, it it's it sounds sexier the way I was saying it before I know but um, very scientific but uh, but had to be done uh, bananas the little ones work okay too um, so uh, so I could go over the specifics with you we do have that stuff on our website and available to the public um, to be able to um, do that we actually have I think I don't know, we have probably 20 protocols. We probably have 60 protocols, but 20 that we've translated into Spanish and French and have them all available on the website for you know, uh, laboratory biosafety, field sampling, all of that. Uh, 
Hi, um, I'm an anthropologist who's been working um, in Sierra Leone near the Liberian border for some 35 years, and I wanted to thank you for incredibly informative uh, talks, and especially Dr. Fellman for recognizing the work of Dr. Muyembe, who really um, should have been for a long time recognized much more than it has been. I just had a couple of clarifications before a question for all of you. Um, one is Dr. Fellman's point about um, too few survivors after the West African outbreak, and my understanding is that in fact the thousands of survivors um, in the West African case actually finally produced a pool of potential clinical study subjects that was actually a kind of turning point in Ebola, pharma, and vaccine research. So I'm not sure what the too few survivors um, was referring to. Um, and to uh, Dr. Mazet's point that after the retreat of um, the international community uh, from the Ebola affected areas in West Africa, there were no labs uh, for detecting Ebola. I assume you're referring to animal labs because since the 1980s, the CDC has had a standing collaboration with the Kenema Hospital and Labs, which also was the only hospital with an isolation unit when Ebola hit. Um, that has for decades been working on Lassa fever, which is an endemic hemorrhagic fever, also in that region, um, and which continues to be a lab in which that can detect, in fact, the Ebola in humans. But this leads to my question, which is, I remember reading retrospective studies of samples taken, for instance, in the Lassa fever uh, lab. Um, in those retrospective studies, it turned out that samples taken as early as 2008, that is years before the actual outbreak, showed the presence of Ebola, but because they were looking for Lassa, um, they weren't actually finding. So um, this virus was there, and obviously below outbreak levels, well before. And um, so I'm wondering, in your designs, uh, for your research studies, whether you can also devise um, tests that look for these kinds of comorbidities and um, the, the, the incidence of these other diseases in the outcomes. You know, when a patient comes in affected by malaria, by Ebola, by all these yeah. things, um, is there a way to gauge uh, the chances, the outcomes, the potential outcomes when you have these other um, things also in play. Sure, I Thank think you. you're talking about the serology study, right? The 2013 um, serology, right? For, so about for the, the for it, the Lassa study that detected. this was a 2008 um, uh, article, a medical article. I can. Get okay, to, I, get it I'm to aware you. of the I'm aware of the serological identification, but not a. I don't know that at least my sort of middle aged brain isn't pulling that one out right now. Um, so uh, there's definitely been serologic evidence. There's some question, and um, Dr. Feldman would be better to speak to it than I. Um, that he has a great serological assay. There's some more in the works um, that can differentiate, but there's a lot of cross-reactivity, and that's kind of what I was alluding to with uh, Bombali. We think that, that maybe some of the background that's complicated, some of the serology could be Bombali or other viruses that weren't detected previously. But I, I am um, with you. I, I believe, and I'm pretty sure there has been this virus there because the bats are there. Right? And so now as we find the, um, the different host range and we can look at their actual ranges, um, we can start to anticipate where it has probably been and, and can be and will be again. So I hope that answers that part of the question a little bit. But I, I, I'd need to see that study specifically. Um, I don't know, do you remember? Maybe good follow up for the coffee break. Yeah. Maybe we're here mm -hmm. were two more questions on this side. Yeah, Brit. Over there. Where's my runner? Here. Britt and Jeff, you had one? I was curious about, uh, for the monoclonal antibody therapies, to what extent is there a concern that there'll be decreased efficacy? Is, is there sequence drift? Are those epitopes known to be intolerant to, to mutation or 
or all the antibodies against different epitopes or particular for the glycoprotein? Well, if you look in general, you would expect escape. That's why I you know, personally think the cocktail approach is the better way to go. But if you look at the efficacy of MAB114, it's a single antibody um, uh, and is one of the top runners at the moment. So it, it certainly depends on the epitope. Uh, that epitope is obviously a very conserved one uh, and doesn't allow very many changes. On the other hand, we also don't know too much about it. It has just been used recently. Um, but, but in more general, as a more general comment, maybe there, I'm sure there are immunologists uh, in the audience that can maybe give you a, a, a better answer, but, but you're, you're correct. You would expect escape, and the idea of cocktail, at least one of the ideas, is to counteract such escape by multiple antibodies that target different epitopes. The, the whole situation gets even more complicated because if you look at some of the cocktails, uh, a lot of people would expect that these are all neutralizing, classically neutralizing antibodies, but that's not the case. Uh, and again, it would need an immunologist to answer your specific question, and I'm not an immunologist. Um, but these are just some general thoughts. Uh, the efficacy of MAB114 uh, uh, is, uh, is amazing as a single antibody. Hello. Hi, I got a quick, 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 question, quick question for the Dr. Parhater. Um, the high mortality, is there, on your clinical study forearms, is that associated with the, that, given the difficult uh, situation in Africa, that patient cannot continuously take the medicine? Because we, I know we have this difficulty in HIV trial in Africa. Like, a lot of patients cannot continuously take the medicine. So they failed at the end of the at the end point. I just want to clarify that all your patient, like five hundred patient, continuously have this treatment. Thank you. So in the Palm study, of the treatments that were tested, remdesivir was the longest treatment course, and that was ten days. And so generally, the patients are in the Ebola treatment units, hopefully receiving other IV fluids and things like that. And so as long as they are alive and able to take the medicine, they complete the entire treatment course. Some of the other, the monoclonal antibodies, they were a single dose. So really it was just one infusion and that is the complete treatment regimen. So it's not like HIV studies where you're given a bottle of pills and sent home and expected to take it every day, but we have no way of checking to see if you're actually taking your medicine. These are inpatient um, treatment subjects and so we are certain of how many doses that they're getting. Um, I'm curious about the um, post Ebola syndrome. I, I wonder what, what the prevalence is. How often does it does it happen? And I'm assuming this happens in both people who cure um, Ebola infection naturally, and not just from people who take treatments. <laughs> um, and um, and if there's some idea as to what the mechanism is of those syndromes. I don't know if, if I'm the right person uh, to answer this. Uh, I was not part. It in your talk, so. I was not. <laughs> that's true. Uh, I was not part of this, so I have not dealt with the the patients or the survivors personally. Um, but if you have severe uh, infections, you see that uh, quite often that people suffer from uh, kind of post-traumatic uh, um, disorders. Um, there is, of course, also now the knowledge of persistence um, and, for example, um, vision loss and, and eye issues could well be associated with that. Um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, virus being present in, in testes and uh, in the reproductive um, uh, tract for, for, for male um, uh, survivors, I don't know if I do not know what kind of consequences that has for men at this point. Um, as I said, transmission can happen. Um, and, and so th there are multiple aspects, uh, but this gives me also a chance to come back to your question one more time. Um, the few survivors uh, uh, that I mentioned were related to the previous, like, 
before West Africa outbreak. The West Africa outbreak had uh, uh, this tremendous amount of survivors as well as DRC now has. Before, we have hardly seen any survivors, and if there were survivors, they just disappeared. And there was no follow-up planned, and there were no follow-up studies. But what was there before, and even uh, more dramatic was the issue with the integration, reintegration of, of uh, people into the communities. Uh, I hope that has gotten better. Uh, I don't know that for sure, but this was very dramatic with the few survivors that I have personally seen in previous outbreaks. They were ba basically outcasts. Uh, I have one last question and the rest will take at the coffee break. Um, I just wanted you to talk about this amazing story of Ebola, how we went over a couple of decades from something completely untreatable to a disease now that we have a working vaccine for treatment options. What's the next big frontier in Ebola? Do you think the problem is now more about access, political, geopolitical questions? I mean, it almost seems like it is the science no longer rate limiting at this point. You know, I think the um, key to controlling these Ebola outbreaks is, you know, almost less about vaccines and therapeutics and just about basic infection control procedures and acceptance by the community of these measures. And I mean, that's just um, a personal viewpoint, but, you know, the number of patients that was treated in the most recent Ebola outbreak is you know, min uh, the minority of patients. And the outbreak continues despite these measures that we have now. So I think it's more than just these concepts that we've discussed today, and maybe more on the detection early and the integration and communication with the community. Yeah, I think the community piece for me, it's the, um, the relationships between the communities and their health systems. Um, and the trust there. And I think our anthropologists uh, on our team and colleagues, uh, we're seeing more and more the, how important it is to have um, anthropologists, social scientists, uh, economic arguments, all of that integrated. Um, so I, I do think that bringing those silos together is, is probably the solution. Um, but that's what we're facing is that distrust, I think. All right, with that, thank you all so much for excellent session. And it's time for coffee break, and we'll meet back here at 11.30, please. <laughs>